Okay, it looks like we're live. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Koviki Talk. Uh, Koviki Talk's a 21 episode series dedicated to the discussion of all things COVID-19, but from the Pacific Islander perspective. So we have educators, doctors, students, community activists, um, all Pacific Islanders talking about all different aspects of COVID-19, but from their perspective. So people who look, think, and talk like us um, talking to us. Today, we're going to talk about uh, mental health and we have two esteemed guests here with us tonight. We have Leafa Taumoipeao, who is the founder of Tao Lama, um, formerly Tao Lama for Tongans, and Dr. Kamale uh, Hamis, who has the blog, Let's Talk Aloha. So I love the saying, by the way, uh, doctor, um, that you have on the front of your blog. It says, a thoughtful mix of research and personal life experience uh, related to Hawaiian well-being. So I like the I like the layout. If you, you guys get a chance for the viewers, if you get a chance to check out her blog, very well put together. Um, and it is, it's a mix of, you know, kind of uh, a research piece of it and then her personal life experiences. I really like that. So welcome, Leah Fa. Thank you, Carl. It's good to, and, good to be here. And welcome, uh, Dr. Kamale. Thank you. So a little bit about Le Fa. Um, Le Fa is um, one of the things that I, that I like about Talama for Tongans, when I look at their Facebook page, it was created in 2009. So a lot of times the people, uh, you, you look at people and think, are they gonna be technologically advanced? Are they going to stay current and stay um, relative? And for Tao Lama to be on Facebook in 2009 and have the, you know, the foresight of, of where that's going to be and where that's going, I thought that shows a lot of, um, a lot of vision for Lea Fa. And Tao Lama for Tongans has done so many different things. Poly by Design has worked with uh, Lea Fa in especially COVID-19. So this is a special piece for uh, me to have Lea Fa on the show to talk to her about you know, the things that she's done to uh, not just the Tongan community to help educate all of the Pacific Islanders. Um, so, you know, I don't have a bio for Leofa. She's very humble and she didn't send one, but um, I can go on and on about all the good things you've done for us, Leofa. So thank you. Thank you, Carl. So um, a quick, I guess a quick question to, before we get into, you know, mental health um, and, and how it relates to COVID. And, and I think that there's a lot of topics that we could talk about in terms of like depression from staying home. Um, some of the kind of uh, things that, that aren't really thought about, you know, they're secondary um, when you talk about sheltering in place and staying at home. But just overall, uh, if, if both of you could take, a, take a, uh, a second, a minute or two and talk about what you do uh, for yourself. So self-care, for people that are leading their community, um, people that other people look to for guidance. And I think it's real easy to get lost and not take care of ourselves. So talk a little bit about what you do. Like I go for walks, I read a lot. Um, and I could go into, you know, a whole bunch about that. But what do you guys do? What do you ladies do um, to keep yourself grounded and, and practice self-care? And let's start with uh, Lea Fa. Okay, thank you. Um... One of the things that, that I keep in my life is, um, is a morning prayer that starts me off. Uh, I have a, a, a prayer partner who is a minister. And, and so we have this every morning uh, and I try to have it as early as possible before my day starts. And um, that's one of the reasons that that's self-care for me. And the other thing that I do is I like to, to meditate about how I have performed that day, like uh, towards the end of the day, then I'd like, because sometimes uh, my schedule is so busy and I'm, I run in different directions, usually like a chicken without a head. <laughs> so, and because of my age, uh, maybe juggling all these things would have, uh, been done better uh, if I was younger. But, um, 
but I'm not younger. I'm not go growing younger. I'm moving forward. And so uh, one of the, the most important things for, the, for what I do in my life is to meditate and take a look at what I have done. And that's when I become very honest, sometimes uh, too honest with myself. But it keeps, it keeps me grounded. And um, it educates me on all my, my failings um, and, and things that I need to do and how I, how I take care of people. Because I, you know, I'm in depth with my, my shortcomings. And so when I, when I do that, then it helps me. It makes it easier for me to move forward. And then uh, most of the time I, I don't feel tired uh, that I really forget I am that old. Uh, and when I talk about being old, I am 76 years old. And uh, maybe that's not very, very old now, but I still, there are times when I feel very old. And that's when I need to, to do my prayer and to sit and look at what I've done. And why is it that it's so, that I feel so heavy laden, you know, and then uh, try and improve on that. I think that's what I, I can share for now. Thank you, Lefa. Um, I think that, that spirituality is a huge piece for the Pacific Islander community. And do you find it more, so you have your prayer time. Um, for me, I meditate as well. When you pray, is that more of your time um, with God? And then the meditation is more time for, for yourself. Is that how you, how you view the difference between the meditating and the, and the prayer? I think to me, the prayer is, is my acknowledgement of my God. Uh, and it's not just in my head and in my heart, but it's, it's verbalized. And, and then um, it's like honoring my God, that I'm not just thinking about him, but through my mouth, I would honor him. Mm. And as for my meditation, that's knowing that there is a God there and knowing that I that I don't have to ask permission or go distances. He's just there within me or right by me. So to me, that's a great comfort that whatever I do, whether it's right or wrong, my failings, he's right there. And so I, I ask for, for salvation. I ask for guidance because I don't have to go to church to do it. I don't have to gather people around me to do it. It's, it's, one-on-one -on -one time with me and my God. Thank you. I think that's uh, because spirituality and God is so important to us. I think that uh, in some instances it can get us in trouble in terms of COVID um, when we don't we don't think it through in terms of being safe. So again, it's a it's a, a big piece of our culture and our community, um, and we got to take that into account when we're talking about COVID nineteen. So. Thank you for sharing how you practice self-care, um, Leafa. Doctor, um, how do you do, I know you write, right? You've on the blog, is that uh, therapeutic? Or how do you, uh, what do you do when you say, I'm gonna take time out for myself for self-care? Uh, what do you do? Yeah, so uh, Leafa had a great answer. Um, and uh, I can say that I feel like I'm still trying to juggle and deal with a lot myself being I'm possibly half her age. So it's tough for, for all of us, right? Um, I'm a, a wife, a homeschooling mom. Um, I work as a therapist, so it's important to take care of myself so then I can also go and help take care of other people. Um, so for me, uh, I kind of look at it like different things. So like mind, body, and soul. So body, I have to make sure that I'm eating well, I'm sleeping well, I'm um, exercising, because if I don't take care of my body, it's hard to take care of my mental health. Um, spiritually, for me, it's important for um, me and my kids to get out to nature. So uh, my kids are young. Um, they're four and six. And so we get out and go to the beach when we can. We go to our regional parks. You know, it's still social distancing. But for me, that's a big part of my um, spirituality is connecting with nature. So we do that. Um, writing, of course, for my Let's Talk Aloha blog is definitely helpful because um, being able to feel like I'm helping others fills me up. And um, and then there's the, the mind part, the mental part. It's the how do I put things into perspective 
you know, if, if things feel, if I'm focusing on one thing and it feels too overwhelming, um, I have to shift focus, maybe zoom out a little bit and say, okay, this is only a season of my life and I can get through it. Um, or if the big picture is overwhelming to me, sometimes I have to zoom in. And think, oh my gosh, the world is, you know, is chaotic and it's so much to, I, I, how can I even make any changes? What can I do? Then I zoom in and I say, what can I do today? What are my values? Um, and for me, my values are family. Um, my families are my Hawaiian culture. So, you know, do I check in on family members to make sure that I'm doing everything that I can do to take care of them? Do I um, stay connected with um, cultural practices like hula? You know, those kind of things fill me up. So, um, yeah, I would say those are my examples of my self-care. When you talk about being of service, it, it is... For myself, it can be a blessing um, because I feel fulfilled. I feel um, like I'm doing something worthy when I'm of service to people. But it can be something where I get lost and I need to practice self-care because it feels so good to help people sometimes. Um, and we see this with a lot of time with community activists. They're so enmeshed in helping people. Um, that they end up running themselves down. So that was kind of, you know, the reason that I picked the topic is you both, both you ladies are in service. Um, you're of service to your community in different ways. And how do we make sure that, to your point, if I'm, if I'm debilitated or I'm less than 100%, I can't help people as much. So I got to take care of myself and make sure that I'm healthy um, and I'm, you know, able to be of service. And I think that, you know, you're, you're a second generation uh, Hawaiian living in Southern California. Um, and did you grow up in Southern California or do you, were, you grew up in Hawaii? Yeah, so my, my mom was uh, born in Hawaii and uh, her father was in the military and like many families from Hawaii, Hawaiian families moved off island to follow military orders, right? So they ended up... Uh, all over the place, Japan, Texas, uh, Alaska, but ended up in California. So um, I was born in California, but I grew up in New Jersey on the East Coast, so even more removed from a Pacific Islander community. I grew up where my mom was the only other Pacific Islander that I knew in the, in the whole state. Um, so uh, being back here in California, um, being able to reconnect with the Pacific Islander community, I think is so helpful for my mental health, uh, my sense of well-being. Uh, a lot of what I talk about and what I aim to talk about in my blog is really that experience. You know, Pacific Islanders aren't a monolith. We, we come from all different kinds of experiences. And um, there's so many more of us that are moving off island and raising children off island. And so, you know, that experience is something, uh, the experience of second generation and forward is something that I hope to give a voice to. Awesome. Um, so we're here to talk about COVID-19 from a mental health standpoint. Um, and what do you see as, as some of the things that are probably missed in terms of mental health? Um, I think there's, there's a host of, of effects that shelter in place, um, no social distancing, those have on the, the general community uh, and the population, but because of the way that our culture and our community operates uh, and because of the way we live in multi-generational homes, there's just a whole bunch of things that the Pacific Islander community is affected um, more severely than the general population. What are some of the things that, that you ladies feel are um, important in a priority, like some of the things you feel are most important or things that you think are missed that most people just don't really think about. And again, I'll defer to Leah Fa. I think um, what's most important is, is how our culture plays out uh, in the community. And, and I'm referring to like funerals, for example, because uh, if you, if you, watch Facebook a lot, you will notice how, and I'm just talking about the Tongans, you don't notice how the Tongans um, take, how they, how they behave when they have funerals. Because for you to have a funeral in your community and not show up uh, labels you 
that you're, you're not Tongan because that's not the Tongan spirit. We, we all show up regardless of whether you have something to bring or not, but it is so important to show up, to show your respect, to show the family that you're um, feeling their loss and you want to be there for them. And so I do a radio program and I do uh, usually, uh, let's see, um, five, about 10 or 12 a month radio programs. And every radio program we have to talk about social distancing, about the mask, about staying away from crowds. And, but I think that people are suffering from, also suffering from um, pandemic fatigue. And so they, they either don't want to listen to you or they're gonna do it anyways, because they feel it's more important. Attending a funeral is more important than the fear of, of um, getting uh, COVID-19. COVID and so that's the challenge. Uh, how do we talk to our people? How do we convince them that, um, that it's much wiser for them to observe because it does, it does kill when you have no consideration of other people. And, and there, we try all kinds of ways of how to, you know, to try and get them. Uh, we think, we say, okay, think about your, your parents or your grandparents, think about your children. The behavior that you show will harm them. You know, it's not just about you, it's about the people that you live with, that you come close to. And yet you still see it. And the, you know, and you see in the news how it's not, it's still going up and up, and the deaths are going up and up. So I I get to the point where I'm at a loss. What else do you tell these people? Because sometimes the um, the response is, you know, it's it's death. If we die, if if it's our turn to die, then we die. And so I think that's a dangerous way to feel, because that means you you're you're not paying attention to anything anymore. You just go your merry way and do whatever it is you want. Um, I try so hard because. You know, I do the radio and I tell people, and yet at the beginning, I couldn't stay away from the funerals because we had quite a few of very senior people in my community that passed away, whether it was COVID related or other things. So it was very difficult because of their age, because of the role they play in the community and because of my age and what I play in the community, it was very important for me to, to make an appearance to show up or at least be at the burial or do something. But it got to the point, so the last five, six funerals, I didn't attend. Uh, it was a, a very difficult thing for me to do, but I, I succeeded in not attending and it doesn't me, make me feel good or feel great about it because I feel like I've betrayed my people, that I don't show my face, especially when it's a funeral. But I think that's something that I will have to live with. But I, because one of my, my children, both my children work for the county and both of them deal with COVID related stuff. And so they both talk to me about my going to these functions. And, um, you know, we have really, really huge arguments over this and it gets to the point where I get so mad and I pull my, mother rank and so that they can both shut up and leave me alone. And then, um, but I know inside me and what I have learned that it is wrong for me to do that. But it got, because I'm torn. I'm a Tongan who is in the midst of this COVID-19 in this country. It's not at home, it's here. So I'm really at the torn and it is as old as I think I am and I should know better, but I couldn't. And so, like I said, it's like the, the last six, and some of them are, are close relatives, some of them are elderly folks that I've worked with in the community. But I have been able to stay away. And 
I can't promise I'll stay away forever, but as of now, I have stayed away. But as far as the challenge of working with Pacific Islanders, especially when it comes to the, to the point where they have decided that it's more important to, to keep their, um, their relationship and to show the love that they have than to observe the, you know, all the, the instructions that are given to you to avoid getting COVID-19. And, and I wish someone would come and give me an answer uh, because I don't have the answer, but, and I struggle with it because I, I can see the deaths, I can see the families that, that all went to Utah to attend a funeral and come back and all are sick, they all have COVID. And so the, the families that live here go over to pay their respect and they end up getting COVID. And so when you see that, and we know that, the, that what we do as people is not right. And yet there is there's practically nothing that we can do to stop it, except to, to talk, keep on talking about it, I guess, uh, praying over it. I don't know, maybe someone from this gathering will come up with the magic answer. I wanna piggyback on what you're saying because I think you know, you said that you don't have the answer and I don't necessarily think we need to have all the answers, but it's just really good that we're talking about it. Like you said, that's the important piece. I think a lot of people are having to navigate these, you know, decisions that are really tough for them because, you know, in their culture, there's expectations and um, there's issues of shame and guilt, depending on, you know, the consequences of your choices. And, um, and that's something real that people are struggling with. Um, you know, you're trying to keep everybody safe, but then you're also dealing with the uh, emotions that um, these consequences uh, dig up for us. And so just you sharing your experiences with having to come to that decision not to attend funerals recently, I think that, you know, maybe that gives permission for other people to say, maybe I need to, you know, consider that too. So just having models in our community that you know people are coming out and talking about the tough decisions that they have to make maybe not having the perfect answer but just showing the struggle i think that's important too you know, one of the um you know having watched previous episodes of koviki talk one of the most poignant moments i thought was i believe it was your last episode where um you know two people shared that they had gotten covid and the tears that were shed and i thought oh my gosh you know that wasn't planned i don't think and uh it it was so important for Pacific Islander community to see that, to, to see that raw discussion because, um, you know, more, more than what we hear from, you know, our government or from mass media or whatever, it's the, the information we get from our own community that really is gonna make the difference for us and help us navigate a little bit better. I think that's a great point, doctor, that um, just like you were saying, Lefa, not having, a black and white answer. Like, here's the answer. Um, I think that there's a lot of people that are waiting for, you know, their pastor or their matai or, you know, their kahuna or, or whoever to just say, we're going to do this and not that. And it's, a, it's not that easy. It's not that black and white. And when you have Leah Fa talking about how, what a tough decision it is and you're going to feel you're going to feel bad either decision that you make. I think that, like you're saying, that opens up the the platform to have the discussion. That it's not a black like there's not an A or a B um, option. It's like they're tough decisions, and they're not decisions the same that that other cultures would make. I think not going to a funeral um, in other cultures is just not a big thing. It's just like oh okay, I just won't go, um, and that's not the way that it is is for us. So I think that having you on Leofa and having you talk about um, and being open about like, I, I'm struggle, I struggle with that decision. Like I went to some and then I, I'm making decisions right now. And then you saying, I don't promise to not go to all of them. I made to make a different decision later. Um, I think that's, that's wonderful. I think that's amazing to share so that people can see, you know, there's not going to be this one easy fits all answer for everybody in every culture. Um, 
So, Doctor, on your on your part, you're a, you are a uh, mother and you homeschool uh, your kids, which you had a big jump on everybody else when it became everybody was going to homeschool. You were uh, you had the experience with that. Um, talk about that from the perspective of being homeschooled uh, or being a, a homeschooled home and the rest of the world isn't. And then like, I would imagine your friends started calling and saying, what do you do with, you know, how do you do this? How do you do that? Talk about being, being that, being a, a homeschool mom. Sure. Um, so my kids are still young, but I've been homeschooling for um, two years, maybe a little bit more than two years now. Um, so I did have a head start um, before COVID happened. And, um, and you're right, I did have a lot of people reach out to me and I'm happy to share whatever wisdom I've you know, gained along the way. Um, but I would say, you know, I, I definitely um, can see the struggle uh, for, for parents who have to do the distance learning that aren't used to having their kids home as much um, are also having to juggle, you know, working um, their role as a, as a em employee and then um, being, you know, full time parent and trying to help out with the education with the lessons. I mean, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot even for me and I signed up for it. Um, but I would say even for homeschoolers, even though we had an edge because you know, we were used to a little bit of this, um, a lot of our days were in, uh, involved going out into groups. So we didn't learn homeschooling as a, as a label is kind of um, misleading. We don't school at home. We school outside of the home. We get together with other groups. We are constantly learning um, with other people. And, and it's one of the things that I love about homeschooling, our ability to do that. So when we had a social distance, it was really hard. We, you know, we moved our um, kindergarten and first graders onto Zoom to try and do our lessons. And I mean, you talk about Zoom exhaustion for adults, it's just, it's hard for kids. And I think a lot of people are, are seeing that with, um, you know, the way that some of the schools are set up now, or a lot of the schools are set up offering, you know, the distance learning. It, it's just really hard. And teachers, I have to give them all the credit, you know, for trying to find ways to be creative and to engage kids while they're also dealing with everything that's going on. It's just, it's just tough for everybody all around. Definitely. Therefore, I wanted to go back to something that you had talked about um, previously in terms of um, COVID fatigue. And you brought up a, a point that I hadn't thought of until you just said it about um, you keep thinking about, well, how else can I say it as Tawama? Um, how can I change the messaging so that it reaches them? And Poly by Design has done the same thing. And if it's in the discussions like with the COVID-19 response team, we're thinking like, how do we do, like, how do we change it? Do we have the doctor or the Faifiao, the pastor, or how do we you change the messaging? And there's almost, it feels like a fatigue with the, educators that are trying to get the message across there's COVID fatigue and like how do I change the messaging to reach um, to get a deeper reach have you felt that in your nonprofit of uh, or can you talk you said you did can you talk a little bit about um, trying to change the messaging up so that you reach more people how many times can you change it um, and how you've adapted to that with Taulama uh, we feel that is a Taulama in workers uh, in our um, inability to compose messages that will take hold or that people will listen to or that will get some sense into people. But they are also suffering from COVID fatigue from listening. Everything that's in the news is about that. It's about death. It's about are people getting infected. And, uh, and so it goes from both ends. So the only thing that, that we can do is, is sit down, have, have a conversation with the people that we work with, the team itself, trying to find out any suggestions. What do they, um, what do they think would help? Who would people listen to? And, um, and I know that, that we would try and, and get younger people to say it and even trying much younger people to say it and for older people to say it. We have an organization that's called Ngatuvai 
and it's uh, it's for seniors. And so what we do is we do Zoom um, on the first Wednesday and the third Wednesday of the month. And we bring in, in as many seniors as we can. And they are suffering from fatigue of being locked into their homes because they, they don't go anywhere. They're, the people, the families, they're busy with whatever they're doing. But at least we found one way of reaching out to this part of the population. And, and they enjoyed it and, and we're so glad, but that's one way. It's just one way. It's not for the rest of the, the community. You know, it's just the seniors. And it's limited to the two um, one hour programs that we have every month. But the, the joy and the, you know, the happiness of being uh, included, of, of, of like being out, even though it's just on Zoom, has encouraged us. But that's just one sliver of the population. So it, it's, it's more thinking, more dialogues, asking, like Patsy Tito from Samoa Development, Taunu Ube'e and Natalie Asun from Samoans and Tongans alike, uh, asking for ideas, even asking our younger people, do you have any ideas that's going to work better than my old fashioned ideas, you know, of how to reach? Because I know that the key of people complying is how the message is given to them. Um, simple, but it will make them understand that, that they, need, they need to see the reality of the, uh, the graph just going up and up and up. They need to look at the people in this country that are tested positive and they look and they need to look at the people that have died and and the majority of them we think unnecessarily but they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time and uh, and all the, the our behavior dictates this our behavior influences uh, the death the people getting uh, checked positive and that's why I, I count myself fortunate in being part of this group. But I also want, want to thank Tavai and Nia and all the people that have put this up because it gives us an opportunity to have this dialogue, uh, maybe to share. And like with uh, Kamale, uh, what she's going through. And she's talking about uh, the, the kids having school at home. I have two grandchildren, one's 11 and one's 12. And they, they both, you know, they both have their classes at home. And I also work at home. And I have my younger daughter who also works at home. And it's crazy because you, you rush into the living room. There's two kids there. And they all, they tell you, shh, you, what? you rush somewhere else. There's someone there. And it's, it is really crazy. But, um, but that's what we do. And uh, I mean, that is the only option we have. But but you can tell how the kids are locked up and how it's unnatural for them. But, but in order to protect them, that's the only way to do it. Great point. Great point with uh, the fatigue of living, you know, everybody living in the same place. Um, Kamala, do you have, um, how did you start your, your, your talk about your blog, the um, Let's Talk Aloha. Um, I clicked through there a little bit to, to take a look at, um, at the different things that you have on there. What got you to, to start the blog? Um, I guess that's the question. And is it, is it still the same thing or has it evolved into something that you didn't see when you started? Sure. So, um, you know, I have my doctorate in psychology. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. And along that journey, I had to write a dissertation. And so um, at the time, I had some great mentors. Um, from my program who said, you need to focus, you know, first of all, there's not many doctors in the world. There's not many female doctors in the world. There's not many Pacific Islander doctors in the world. There's not many Hawaiian doctors in the world. You need to put your energies there. And, um, you know, being second generation, mainland Hawaiian, being mixed, um, it, I, I always grew up without even being able to articulate it. I always grew up um, not really fitting, feeling like I fit in with a Hawaiian culture or label. 
And so it intimidated me to think that I would do a dissertation. So um, I did. I jumped in. Just how I jumped into Kobiki Talk, not really knowing what I was getting myself into, I said, let's just do it and we'll figure it out later. Um, so, uh, so I did it and I was able through that process of doing research, uh, first of all, I did my literature review and I read all kinds of, um, you know, research and information books, um, both native authors and otherwise, uh, about Hawaiian history, about Hawaiian culture, Hawaiian identity, and it just turned my world upside down. I went on an emotional roller coaster, things that I didn't learn in my Western education. Um, I found out through that process and, uh. And then I sat with the people um, who I interviewed and I realized my story actually isn't that, um, you know, isolated. It's not that unique that a lot of people share the story. And so um, I realized from conversations that I had with my participants how important it would be to share my research with other people um, to kind of help create a sense of community for, for us who felt like we were on the fringe of a, a Hawaiian community. Um, and so uh, I planned to, and then I had two kids, and that kind of <laughs> distracted me for a bit, as kids usually do. Um, and uh, and but recently, I've been able to start up, um, you know, the website, the Instagram account. I've been sharing my research bits and pieces there. I've been sharing my personal experiences, and it really just goes back to that idea that it's important to share and to dialogue. You know, we're not going to know that other people are going through similar things and struggling with similar things or succeeding in similar in similar ways if we don't share that information. So that's really the purpose of it. You know, it'll change as I, as my life changes, as my kids get older, the content will change, but really behind it, that's the purpose. How long, how long has it been up? Um, since I believe October of last year. Okay. Um, so there, there's let's let's talk about that for a little bit because um, Lefa, you had talked about uh, the media, like we see things on a certain on on media, um, and blog is a form of of uh, transfer of information and transfer of opinion. What are you? What's your opinion on the role that the media has played um, with COVID nineteen from a mental health perspective? So. Um, the images and the way that things are 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 portrayed, and again, Leifah had spoken about this earlier um, about what we see. Talk a little bit about um, what you what role you think the media has played um, and how it affects people's mental health. Um, so, Leifah, since you had already talked about it, I'll I'll turn back to you. I think that um, I understand the importance. Uh, of the part that the media plays in our lives. I understand that. But I don't know how, how do you, it, uh, what's enough uh, as far as the, uh, the information that comes out. And, and I know that's, I know that's part of, of having uh, media and of having radio and television is to to put out the information out there. But I'm also wondering about the, the thinking of the experts, of, of people who know, who know about this. Is there a point where you think this is enough? Uh, that would be, in my thinking, that would be um, useful because, because the, the the output of information is not lost because you you have this fatigue, or because you're you're buried under the all the useful information that's coming out. So I always wonder about that. Is there is there a body that that could uh, decide how much will be useful and and give it to us that way? Uh, because we're we're like our kids in a toy in a candy store. Um, I mean, all the candy is out there, so we eat as much as we can till we get sick. And so with me, the, the information that's put out there for us, and, you're bomb and we are bombarded from the moment we open our eyes to the moment we close our eyes. So I'm thinking, if this is causing pandemic fatigue, if this is causing people to to retaliate by, by not doing it, 
just because they're tired of hearing about it, then there's got to be a better way to do this. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just a thing that I wonder about. Because like in, in my case, I talk about COVID-19 like every day, every day for five days. And then I also talk up, that's on Tuesdays. And then I talk about it on Saturdays. Then I talk about it on the first and third Wednesday of the month. But I, but so what we're doing is trying to put other things there, uh, make it uh, like with the, the elderly folks program, make it a little fun, uh, put in a little exercise. Because I understand how tiring it is to always just be hearing about COVID-19. Uh, and as much as we, we, learn to, we, we need to learn about it and as much as we need to observe the rules about COVID-19, but it can also have the effect of, of making us um, just like kids. You know, you, you may tell them all the good things and how to be respectful and how to do good and all that. But sometimes they want to do the opposite thing just because they're tired of being told what good things to do. I don't know. That's just my, my way of thinking. Because when I see it and I say, and I get mad when people get mad about too much COVID talking, because I said, no, we need that. We need to hear that. But, you know, but that's me because I'm part of this conversation and I'm that side. But when I come back and sit and think about it and I say, yeah, it, you know, it, it gets tiring. It, as truthful and as useful as it is. But I wonder why the people in this field don't, don't come up with other ways, you know, to connect this to us. I, I'm just wondering, you know, yeah. and, uh, and in this conversation, I am no expert in anything, but I can wonder. I think that's a, a good point of like, you know, we're so creative in different ways that we message. We're, you know, you think about like things like TikTok and Instagram as, as social media evolves. There's so much creativity and ways in messaging. It just seems that having a ticker with a death count that is on the screen that just rolls like, you know, you just see the numbers going up continually. It seems like that at some point somebody would figure out a more creative way to message that to us so that we don't feel the way that we do um, about that. Um, Doctor, how about you? From, from your perspective, uh, what, what role do you think the media has played? I mean, some of it's good, some of it's bad. Um, but from a, you know, from mental health and a COVID-19 uh, perspective, what role do you think they've played? Yeah, I think, you know, it's as consumers of media, we have to be responsible and think about the motivations of um, the people putting out the information. So, you know, are they, are they putting out the information because they're focused on, you know, the bottom line being money? Are they from a, you know, community organization that's trying to help their people and they're doing it because they care? You know, it's, it's there's different motivations behind um, people putting out information. And uh, we have to be smart as consumers, uh, understand where that, where, who's putting out the information and then also being honest with ourselves and saying, you know, sometimes enough is enough, um, which I think was, was uh, what Liafa was saying. It, and so in my house, we don't have the TV on. Um, we don't watch news on TV, especially because it doesn't do anything for my mental health to, I mean, it's not positive at all for me to have that on in the background. And I know from my kids who don't understand fully what they're watching on TV to hear kind of the, you know, the intensity that certain things are talked about, they're getting scared and they don't even know why. So um, TV doesn't go on in our house. When I want news, I um, am very specific on how I get, I go online and I'll, I'll find a newspaper or um, trusted sites or trusted organizations that I get my information from. And that's just because I've noticed early on that you know, just leaving it on channel, whatever news, it just isn't helpful for me. Everyone else, you know, has to make decisions for what feels right for their families. But I just think being more, um, you know, more aware of the, of the media that we're consuming. And I think this goes not only for COVID-19, but, you know, I love the past episodes of Koviki Talk. You've covered a lot of this, you know, election stress and, um, uh, you know, even uh, election stress, the, um, 
racial tension and you know addressing systemic racism. I mean, these are all things that have been on our media, um, and and it's a lot to digest. So just being mindful of what we're digesting is important. Yeah, I think to to both of your your points of uh, being uh, Lefa, your point about from the moment, moment we wake up to when we go to bed, we're being bombarded by information. And Kamale, your your comment about, you know, we just have this news that's just gonna, you know, we're gonna get bombarded from every area. Um, we talked about this on the, the FICA podcast about where do you get your information and how you get, you just have to be um, discerning about where you get information because it's, you had talked about that earlier. Why are they messaging this? Is it a slanted to the left or slanted to the right um, kind of, of resource? Um, so being responsible, especially for your kids, um, and that, I think that's awesome that you're very selective about what goes in. You know, your kids in a very formative period, right? They're they're forming themselves and who they are at this point. Um, I think that's that's a great thing to do as a parent, but from a self-help standpoint and self-care, um, I think it's more important now than ever to filter what you see um, so that you don't, you don't end up with just one side of the story or you don't end up with you know, fear-based stuff because it's real easy to, um, to both of your points, it's real easy to get swept up in, you know, it's the end of the world or if this doesn't happen, you know, it's the most important presidential election in the history of our country. Every presidential election, they say that, you know, but, you know, it's, it's fear-based and it's fear-driven. So um, I think those are great points of view. And I love, Leifi, I love that you're, you're saying, I just wonder, I wonder, you know, that's just what I'm wondering. That's what I'm thinking. Um, so real quick, I'm going to um, talk about who makes this available, this platform that we have. We thank the Pacific Islander Center of Primary Care Excellence, PICOPSI. Uh, PICOPSI was established to improve the health of Pacific Islanders in the United States and U.S. Pacific through primary care support, research, workforce development, and community initiatives. So we love PICOPSI. They're an ally. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Beverly Quintana, Christine Allerkin, and Nia. You already, had already called Nia out um, and, and thanking them for the platform and be able to, to be here and talk about uh, the things that we're talking about. Real quick before I forget, I want to uh, talk about why I'm the only one here from Poly by Design and Naki isn't. Um, Naki is recovering from COVID-19. She has damage to her lungs um, that she is going through uh, respiratory rehab so that she can get full use of her lungs back. And it was important to her um, that I say the words that I'm saying that people know why she's not here, that COVID doesn't know, you know, it doesn't know whether you're, I don't know, tall, short, Republican, Democrat, whatever, like the disease doesn't, the virus doesn't care. Um, she is, you know, one of the biggest advocates for, you know, social distancing and wearing a mask and, you know, all the things that we talk about um, and COVID doesn't care. COVID, you know, it's a virus and it doesn't see things that, that people see. So she wanted to make sure that everybody understood. Um, once again, another reminder of how important it is to follow the safety protocols um, and, and be aware, you know, don't have to be live in fear of it, but be aware of what, you know, how to keep yourself safe. So that's my, my message for Naki. I'm, I'm not pretty sure. I'm very sure she's she's watching right now. Um, so get better, Naki. We can't wait till you're back. Um, so back to our ladies. Um, what's important right now for Talama? Um, again, I, I don't think I express I express this enough. You always talk about your age, Leifa. In 2009, you knew that social media was going to be important to your nonprofit, and I bet you there's a ton of nonprofits that didn't get that in 2009. So your vision is perfect. It was the perfect place to get on and, and a good way to grow um, your reach for your nonprofit. So again, kudos for that. But what's important right now for Talama? Anything, any projects, any uh, things that you're going on that you have as a priority for your group? Uh, 
I've always liked mental health. Uh, I retired from the county uh, working for mental health. And because of what's happening right now in the, the expressions and the, the, the stories that I hear from, from my people that I work with, it's, it's about mental health and how uh, the community need this mental health right, especially at this time. And so I think that's our, our focus is going to shift and we are going to address. We've been having um, Zoom uh, panels on, on mental health, uh, inviting church leaders to come on board and talk about it. But I think because it's such a, a stigmatized disease for Pacific Islanders, for Tongans, uh, it's not that easy to talk about mental health. But we have found that the advantage of uh, speaking in another language is that mental health becomes something easy that we talk about because it's in English. It, but uh, my, my team and I talk, we have Tongan programs in mental health and we would like to, uh, to improve on that and, and increase that uh, to kind of uh, move a little bit from COVID and talk about mental health and how COVID has um, influenced the mental wellness of people. Were you, um, were you drawn to mental health early on? Um, because it, it does seem it's a very consistent theme um, that you talk about. Was that something that you saw yourself doing early on or is that something that you just kind of developed into um, as, you, as your work career progressed? Uh, it's uh, understanding it, it, understanding it a little bit more, understanding it better as I, as I grew in my work life, um, because I used to fear mental health as a Tongan, because the disease is so stigmatized, you grow up fearing mental illness. And then when I came here, and I lived in Southern California and moved here in uh, 2000, the year 2000. And so my first job here was to work from, at the county mental health. But I, I overcame my fear of mentally ill people. The first day I went in for my final interview, I walked in and in the, the lobby was someone that was mentally ill and and they were um, known as, as a rocker because she kept on rocking back and forth. I couldn't contain my fear. I finally got up, walked outside and waited outside till I was uh, called to go in. That's how mental health was to me. But I worked my way through it. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's, a, it's a different thing. And, and the people who are mentally ill, they're... they're the most beautiful people that you ever, would ever come across. And to see a breakthrough, it's like no other. But um, knowing that mental health, it's not that you have to be diagnosed and you get sick, but it's also something that happens to the community at large. And it comes out, uh, it um, comes out in how we keep our va, and we're so huge on keeping our va whether you're Tongan or Samoan or Fijian. And some of those vas are broken because there's mental health unwellness in the community. Mm -hmm. And it's happened to church groups, to women's groups, to families. You see, you see it um, coming out. And, and that's why I, it's most important for me to, to work on mental illness, to work on mental wellness. Uh, one of the projects that we're doing with, um, with uh, Alameda County is on mental health wellness of Pacific Islanders. And, and uh, that's led by Natalie Asun. And that is uh, in uh, Taunu Ve'e. But that is such a rewarding program uh, because we are making an attempt and we're starting to work and share. Thank you, Lefa. Uh, we have a question from our uh, Facebook uh, group. It says, uh, thank you, 
for having this very important and much needed conversation about COVID-19. We are a God-fearing people that tends to take a fatalistic view and approach to life events and anything that might be, quote, heavy, unquote, topic. That type of thinking is deadly and unnecessary. How can we change that? You know, if only we had a doctor of psychology that was supposed to, oh, actually, we have a doctor in the house. Kamala, do you want to take that one? Um, sure. Um, you know, I have to be honest for myself, and maybe Leah Fah can help me out here. Um, I'm not a practicing, um, I'm not practicing any religion, so the God-fearing part I'm going to need help on. But just um, dealing with, you know, the fatalistic view and, um, you know, avoiding heavy topics, I think that just goes back to the importance of the conversations that we're having. That's how we're changing it. It's showing that, you know, even though it's a heavy topic, even though um, we might have fatalistic views, that it's something that our communities can handle talking about. I even think about, you know, my role as a mother. I want my kids to know that they can come and talk to me about heavy topics. We don't avoid it. We don't, you know, um, I'm not the authority in the house where it's just you do what I say and that's it. I want to have ongoing open conversations. And I think um, in whatever way we can do that, that's going to help change it because it is deadly otherwise. So if you can change it, if you have any, um, you know, authority in your house to, if you're a parent or if you're, you know, an elder, if you are a community, part of a community organization, if you have any power, use it for good, open up those conversa conversations, show other people, model it for other people how to do it. It's so important to talk. Like it, it's all starts with talking. At some point you got to have the conversation. Lefa, um, how, in your mind, how do we um, not be so, take such a fatalistic view and approach to, to heavy topics? Um, in your mind, how should we, how can we change that? Because I, I believe that there is no topic that's uh, taboo for us. And it doesn't have to be a complicated topic, but for, for the way we live and for our lives, it is important that we, that we are courageous enough to attempt to talk about it. And it's, it's in, and I think that the conversation uh, is one of the most useful things for us is to know that what I'm feeling, somebody else is feeling that also. And, and there is a, a kinship, uh, especially at this difficult time, uh, to know that I'm not the only one suffering. Other people are suffering. And how did they do it? How did they overcome it? How did they uh, come out of the hole or the, the darkness that they're in? And I, and I know that we need professionals to lead us. Uh, we are very fortunate. We have two young men with our, with our Rams um, Alameda County projects, and that's uh, Tupi and Manu. And they're wonderful young men, they're, they're clinicians. And, and I'm putting this invitation out there that if you ever need to talk, please call Tupi or Manu. But I think that it's up to us. If we make it a stigma, then it then we will be slaves to that stigma. But if we understand that that's a very human thing that we all go through our ups and our downs, that it would help us to talk about it. It would help us to trust one another because we Pacific Islanders like to talk about everything, things that we should talk about and things that we shouldn't talk about. But if we honor each other and if we feel this compassion towards one another, then we know that if I know that what I'm going to talk about is going to hurt you, then I should refrain, then I should stop. Because that's what this love and this aloha is all about. It's us taking care of one another. And I think that's why it's important for the conversation on mental wellness should be exercised a lot in the community. Uh, because I think that is one way that we, we can uh, help ourselves is to understand that we all go through mental health issues at one time or another. It's not just uh, a family that were stigmatized because they had mental illness and you weren't allowed to marry into them. 
because of the fear of that mental illness. But I am now come to the conclusion and I understand why the fear is because we didn't know. And everything that was out of the ordinary that we didn't know, we feared. And like uh, the disease, tuberculosis, TB, it was a deadly disease for my island. And I am talking from a personal uh, point of view because my mother had TB and she died from TB. But when I grew up, that was uh, something that was stigmatized. But I, I learned as I grew up and, and grow older that, that it's, a, it's a sickness and nobody asked for it. And it did kill people. And one of the, the victims of, of that disease was my mother, but it was nothing to be ashamed of. And, and I think when we strip ourselves of, the, of that shame, then we'll be more comfortable, we'll breathe easier and help each other that much more. Thank you, Leah Fah. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, and rest in peace to your mother. Um, let's see, an hour has flown by. Um, and we, that's what we talked about. We need to talk. So we did, we did a lot of talking. I think we talked about some really good topics um, that need to be out there. Um, Dr. Hamas, if people want to read your blog, if people want to get a hold of you, um, how do they do that? So uh, they can go to my website, letstalkaloha.com. They can also find me on Instagram with the same uh, at Let's Talk Aloha. Um, either way. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you for your time. Lefa, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I know it's it's hard to get you um, in a speaking slot, so I can definitely appreciate um, having you here on my screen and sharing your wisdom with us. Um, if people want to um, get, a, get a hold of Tao Lama for Tongans, um, there's too many things to list that your organization does for the PI community, but how do they find you? Um, they can call my, my number. <laughs> because I'll be, uh, then I'll pick up. Because if they call the office, usually nobody's there. Uh, and it's 650-200-8959. Uh, Thank you, Leah Fa. Thank you, Dr. Hamas. Um, and thanks everybody for tuning in. Please check us out. We will be, we're back in, in play. So today is the, uh, our first show back. And then we will be back again next Monday. Uh, same time, same space. Come back to um, Koviki Talk with us. Naki, we love you. Get better. Keep resting. Um, and we'll catch you back here soon. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Speedy recovery, Naki. <laughs> <laughs>